The next presentation, so I would, I would like to finally introduce Dr. Connor Jamison. He will be giving us a review on the regulatory requirements for stability studies of antimicrobials for opioid use. Dr. Jamison is the original antimicrobial stewardship lead at the UK. He is an experienced hospital pharmacist with a special interest in antibiotics, extensive experience in antimicrobial stewardship programs, and he, has, he was a former council member and honorary treasurer for the PSAC, and as well as he is currently chairing the Drug Stability Working Program for the PSAC Opat Initiatives. So Dr. Jameson, please share your slide and take it forward. Well, thanks very much, Ricardo, for that lovely introduction, and thanks to Jason and the team for the invite to come and present. So, thanks. Uh, so, good evening, everyone, and uh, greetings from the UK. Um, so, Fakad has already covered um, some of the bits in my slide, so I'll try and go through those as quickly as possible, so that there's time for questions and stuff at the end. Um, so just to say that I've got no declarations of interest, um, and so the overview for my talk is really just to put into context uh, drug stability testing program of BSAC, which is part of the wider BSAC initiative. And I think we, it's probably clear already from the presentations, but you know why drug stability testing is important. Outline the approach to regulation in the UK, um, and go into a little bit of detail about the yellow cover document, which has been already mentioned by Nicoletta and Ficade, uh, and then maybe talk about the challenges and consideration of next steps where we go from here. Um, so just to put into context, so the BSAC OPAT initiative, which Mark Gilchrist and Andrew Seaton lead, um, kicked off in 2009 and has been running now for 12, 13 years and uh, lots of, uh, you know, landmarks along the way, which um, as Nicola referred to, the good practice recommendations for adults and uh, pediatric patients. Uh, but drug stability came into the program in uh, sorry, the initiative in 2016. Um, following sort of surveys from um, uh, OPAT user, uh, OPAT services in the UK and the wider field as to, you know, what the challenges and the barriers were to um, extending OPAT services and making them more patient focused, I guess, and patient friendly. Um, and so I suppose, you know, considering why OPAT um, is important, uh, sorry, why stability is important to OPAT, you know, if you're thinking of Callum, um, you know, if we're trying to treat Callum with um, a continuous infusion in an OPAT service, we need to ensure that the data, as Nicola mentioned, on the stability is, is robust and that we can treat treat him effectively and safely. Uh, and, you know, considering what Foucault has mentioned at the end about achieving PKPD targets, um, but, you know, what's the role of stability in, in helping that um, and also having an understanding of when a drug does break down, if it is unstable, um, what, is, what, what is the knowledge of, of those degradants and is there any considerations around that? So, um, you know, so really the focus here is, you know, what are the regulations around drug stability and how well do current antibiotics, um, when tested, meet those uh, regulations? And as Fakadi mentioned already, um, this, this review in 2017, which published in 2017, looked at the literature um, in the context of the yellow cover document requirements at the time to see how many published studies matched those requirements. Um, and as Fakadi alluded to, there was, there was no published studies that matched the UK national standards, which is a barrier because um, if for those um, for those antibiotics to be used in OPAT services in the UK, we need to have evidence of stability. And although there was um, sort of commercially commercial stability data that wasn't publicly available in open access, um, which was a limitation for NHS services to develop further. So just taking a step back uh, and rewinding to 1968. So in the UK, the Medicines Act of 1968. Um, it obviously covers a lot of provisions around medicines and prescribing, but in terms of the licensing for medicines and um, medicinal products, um, sets out the, the regulations. And there's a section, something called a Section 10 exemption for pharmacists, which I think might be Section 8 in Australia, but essentially allows pharmacists to um, prepare uh, unlicensed medications in hospital or health centre under the supervision of a pharmacist and in accordance with the prescription. Uh, and there's a couple of other bits there, but I won't dwell too long on that. So really we're thinking here about the sort of hospital aseptic um, uh, preparation facility um, and the requirements for uh, for its sort of safe running and, and the, the, the products that it assembles and uh, prepares to, to meet OPAT. Um, and I'm not really going to consider much around um, the commercial side of things, but they are subject to the same good manufacturing practice like um, 
requirements and the same standards in terms of aseptic production. Um, but essentially aseptic preparation units in the UK, and I'm sure it's similar in Australia and other uh, uh, places, uh, run under the operation or the supervision of a pharmacist. Um, they're you know, aseptically prepared and uh, products are aseptically prepared in closed systems, whether that's chemotherapy, whether that's antimicrobials, total parental nutrition, uh, although probably less so uh, that's usually outsourced to commercial providers. Um, and that the products that are produced um, either are developed from licensed sterile medicinal products or else sterile ingredients are prepared in manufacture uh, uh, prepared in licensed facilities. Um, but the big limitation around um, unlicensed preparation in the NHS is that it can have a maximum expiry of uh, seven days. Um, but also the pharmacist releasing those products needs to be assured of the, sh the shelf life assigned to that product and that, that it's supported by robust stability data um, and that the products themselves are made in accordance with NHS guidance. Uh, which fundamentally c concerns the standards around the, the quality assurance of aseptic preparation. So the personnel, the facilities, the training, the, the documentation. But a critical thing and relevant to our discussions here today is around shelf life and stability assessment. So there's advice there on the standards for assessing stability uh, in terms of the quality of the information, the source of that information, whether it's published data in the literature, in-house data, data from manufacturers, uh, how that data is interpreted and also consideration for factors which affect stability such as refrigeration, storage, uh, photo degradation and all these various things. So coming on to the yellow cover document which has been mentioned uh, several times already which unsurprisingly is, in, is a yellow cover document so that's where the name comes from um, and that sets out the standards for assessing stability of a whole range of molecules. There's a number of parts to it but the one we're interested in today is the aseptic preparations of small molecules, which includes antimicrobials. Um, and as Fakadi alluded to already, there's a section in there which is sort of relevant to elastomeric devices. Um, and just to say that the stability testing program just zeroed in on elastomeric devices for OPAT services really is a pragmatic consideration because they're often the most convenient thing um, to use in OPAT. Uh, and also, you know, we, we didn't have unlimited funding to, to do stability testing, so we had to choose uh, to look at elastomeric devices over, say, syringes or infusion bags, as Nicolette's already mentioned. So with elastomeric devices, those are tested at 32 degrees Celsius, which is skin temperature. Um, it used to be 37, but they had new evidence in about 2015 uh, of uh, tr with transit dermal devices. So the temperature was lowered to 32, which is the real uh, boost for OPAT uh, and antibiotic stability. But you need to consider the, the stability of time naught, so the starting point, but also four additional time points, which include the end of the, the run out period, as it were, to make sure that you've got a full stability profile over, over the in use period and the storage period of the uh, product you've manufactured. And then, as you might expect, there's standards around, you know, how many devices you test and duplicate, triplicates at various time points, which makes uh, doing these stability studies quite complex and Fakadi knows well I think having worked with us on some of these projects before um, up late at night or in early in the morning to do the to do the samples and take multiple samples um, but we're looking at the colour the clarity and the precipitation any obvious uh, evidence of degradation but there's a you know on throughout the whole process there's consideration of the concentration of the uh, the API, the active pharmaceutical ingredient, <coughs> excuse me, by um, uh, HPLC usually, looking at some visible particle counts, monitoring the pH to make sure that that isn't um, changing over time, which is a, another indicator of uh, instability or would drive uh, changes in stability, and looking at degradants as well, so understanding what, what, what degradation is taking place, because that could be quite critical. Um, and a really important consideration is that if there's a pharmacopoeia limit already existing for that product in terms of how much loss is acceptable, um, so for, for example with keftazidine you can lose up to 10% uh, and that's still within the monograph specification, but if there's no BP monograph limit, which for a number of antibiotics there isn't, then in the UK the default position is 95 to 105%, so you can lose 5% uh, and no more than that. Um, and also, if there's a the British Pharmacopeia limit around degradation products, then that also needs to apply to the study and the, the storage and the in-use period, which can limit stability as well as, as we saw with um, pyridine um, with keftazidine. Um, but so, as I'm, I'm not an aseptic uh, expert, I don't have any background in aseptics. Um, and but as a sort of antibiotic pharmacist, I was involved in our OPAT service when I used to work in an acute trust. 
and um, I didn't necessarily have a good understanding of the issues concerning drug stability testing because it wasn't my area. So um, that, that became clear to us. And so I worked with some colleagues to write some yellow cover document guidance on pharmaceutical issues concerning OPAT. So if you're an ID physician or a microbiologist, you know, what do you really need to know or what questions do you need to be asking your pharmacy team about the assurance of stability for the products you'd like to use? If you're the antibiotic pharmacist or the steward of some sort, you know, do you understand what the aseptic technical team might need to consider? Um, if you're the chief pharmacist, do you have oversight of all of these things happening to make sure that the medicines supplied to patients under your sort of supervision are appropriate. So, so that guidance document is kind of a, a first draft, uh, well, it's the first edition of that, which is just helpful for people to think about questions they should be asking around stability in OPAT. Um, and as I've only dwell on this, because Fakad, Fakad has kindly covered a lot of this already, but we have done some open access publications with so that's in our remit to publish our data open access whether it's positive or negative and as as mentioned already so flucloxacillin and piperacillin tazobactam we've got really good yellow cover document standard stability data for it um, we investigated meropenem but unfortunately even with buffering couldn't make it stable enough to to last more than six hours but again it was important to publish that data and recent work looking at keftalazine tazobactam stability as well which we got stability for 12 hours on um, so the summary table here, I won't go through it in any detail, but just the points I would make is that for penicillins, it seems that citrate buffering is important. And for cephalosporins, it doesn't, oh, apologies, it appears that um, buffering isn't particularly helpful um, and doesn't seem to affect stability. Um, and a, a key driver for us with OPAT is, for pragmatic reasons, is to get the longest fridge storage time possible. Um, so we really try for 14 days or longer if we could, but it depends on a bit of pre-scoping work and knowledge of the stability of the, the agent. Um, and you can see that for keftazidine, for example, you don't get much fridge, fridge time before you, before you can put it into use, and even then you don't get much in use time. Um, as say tamicillin as well. And I just point out that for keftolazine, tazobactam and tamicillin, as Fakata mentioned, here 12 hours is the 95% limit so in territories where that isn't uh, countries and where that isn't um, the strict limit and it's 90% there is the option for 24 hour infusion and I say we're just doing some work on a cycle at the moment and I'll mention that in a second. Um, so really the challenges uh, around drug stability and OPAT are meeting the regulatory requirements first of all so generally there is a pharmacopoeial requirement for most injectable medicines to have uh, the product be within 95 to 105 percent of the state of concentration during its shelf life and also the in use period um, and that's a general pharmacopoeial standard for parental preparations now if there's a, a, a pharmacopoeial limit which allows a greater loss than that then you, you know you can lose up to 10 percent but that's not many uh, antibiotics uh, we know that antibiotics certainly the beta lactams are inherently unstable once you put them into solution you, you know you've got a this the stopwatch has started you've only got so much time so trying to have an extended storage period along with an in-use period um, to make it more pragmatic and easy to order and keep in stock and be ready for patients and and convenient and all the pragmatic considerations around that is a real challenge as well because the drug is in solution for that much longer than i say a fresh fill device for example um, we know that testing at 32 is a challenge uh, most sort of stability testing is at sort of 20 to 25 degrees celsius room temperature but as facad is clearly indicated you know actual ambient temperatures are often higher than that um, and devices if they're left in the sun or left under the bed clothes and that can go well above 32 and I think Stephen Park's review recently was advocating for a testing at 34 degrees Celsius to sort of take into account um, the, the sort of the warmer climates like on, you find in Australia um, and just going on following on from that point so maintaining the device reservoir is cool so I know some studies have looked at using ice pucks and things to chill chill the reservoir uh, to try and keep it below the ambient um, uh, climate temperature I guess uh, and that you know people have done that with meropenem I think in Australia and stuff so it's not something we've looked at um, and the validity um, I suppose validating that those those cooling devices is, would be the challenge but that you know that is, that is an important consideration when we think about sort of tro more tropical climates as to how to keep the the um, the, the reservoir fluid cool. Um, as I mentioned already, storage periods prior to administration are you know a challenge. We try to get the longest period we can for pragmatic reasons, but that does increase the risk of degradation. And another particular challenge, I'm not sure if it is in the in Australia or other other countries, but in the UK, just the sort of manufacturing capacity, the aseptic production capacity is limited. So if you want to 
expand OPAT services and produce more, uh, uh, sorry, prepare more elastomeric devices and more antibiotics in them as we do more stability testing, that puts a challenge on those services which already have to deliver chemotherapy, parental nutrition and other um, aseptically prepared products. Um, so in terms of our next steps with um, from a BSAC perspective, um, the OPAT initiative is just sort of undergoing a sort of strategic review and that's in process, Mark and Andrew are leading on that process and developing you know, the next strategy over the next three years. Um, we'd like to think we've contributed a lot to the conversation, but we need to join with colleagues like Fikadi, Jason and others around the sort of uh, consensus around global uh, stability, uh, global consensus around stability testing and also consideration of um, you know, should stability testing be built in earlier into the regulatory process, for example, so that we don't have to do it after the drug is licensed? Um, could that be a consideration? Um, and we've got an OK, o, UK OPAT conference coming up in November. Uh, and again, we're going to look to see what the, have a conversation and a space to discuss and debate the international issues around elastomeric devices. So obviously breakpoints are, as they change and, you know, considerations, as Fakadi mentioned, are achieving PKPD targets are really critical. There's the stability, the licensing and regulation, as I alluded to, and really important to have a, you know, a really international uh, conversation around that and a consensus, hopefully, if that can be achieved. Um, if anyone's at ECMID, in uh, this month, well, next month, sorry, uh, it's in April. Um, we're going to be presenting some data that Fricardi and Jason have been working on on a cyclover stability, and also we looked at amoxicillin um, stability. So if you're at the conference, either in person or online, please look out for those posters. Um, and I'd just like to finish by thanking um, my colleagues in the Drug Stability Testing Working Party, uh, who do a huge amount of work in the background, uh, Jason, Fakadi, and Stephen at the University of Queensland, who've been a fantastic collaboration in the last couple of years, colleagues at BSAC HQ, Felicity, who keeps the ship afloat, and our, you know, we, 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 we collaborate with the pharmaceutical industry and device manufacturers to support um, some of the work that we do. So again, thanks to them. Um, um, yeah, and please do check out the BSAC EOPAT website. It's got all of our stability data and lots of other resources on there and information. And uh, I'll leave it there for Kadi. Thank you, Paul. A very nice presentation indeed. We we'll now stretch going into the discussion sessions. I would like to remind that in this two tab, you have any questions you may have in the question and answer tab there.